Hello. It's great to be doing this. Um, I'm really looking forward to getting a lot of interaction um, and comments for this presentation throughout the conference. So I'd like to start my screen share and we can all see. Let's see. We can all see uh, the screen. Hang on one second. So the reason why I would like to talk to you about having a more inclusive approach to astronaut training is because by doing so, we can make space more accessible to more people and give opportunities and support to people who would never think about going into space before. And my wish is actually to make space accessible to as many people as possible. And I think this approach of what I'm going to talk about today is uh, helpful in doing so. So before I get into the details of the talk, I'd like to introduce myself for those people who don't know me. Um, I'm originally uh, from New York and I have studied in, uh, at the university in the States um, for my bachelor's and master's in the US and, and uh, came to the Netherlands to get my PhD in human factors engineering. Um, my dream was always to become an astronaut. And uh, as soon as I got my PhD, I started working I started applying to NASA and I got on their highly qualified astronaut candidate list, which is kind of the last 200 people. Wasn't lucky enough to make it further. Uh, but in the meantime, I worked uh, in the oil industry uh, and in corporate life uh, for 23 years across 35 countries. So I got you know, a sh my share of working in extreme environments um, like offshore and getting uh, some really incredible experiences uh, in different places around the world. Um, when uh, there was a reorganization, the company I was working for asked me if I would like to uh, get a course in, in securing my next job um, as part of the package. And I was very um, excited to tell them, uh, yes, please. Uh, I wanted, and they said, what do you want to be in your next job? And I said, well, actually an astronaut. And uh, they laughed and thought, oh, very funny. But actually I managed to convince them to send me away to, uh, this is a picture of me at the NASTAR Center um, in Philadelphia, getting ready to go into the centrifuge. So I would get a feel for uh, what it was like to become a commercial astronaut and learn a bit about it. And when I saw, uh, although I was having a great time spinning around and around uh, in the centrifuge, uh, you know, smiling from ear to ear, I saw some other people on my course that weren't as happy as I was. In fact, they had a terrified look on their face. And I remember thinking at the time, you know, aren't there courses out there, not just to help people physically get used to the G-forces of going into space, but also mentally. Um, and they said, no, uh, there didn't exist something like that. And I thought, hey, that's something I can do. And I started uh, inner space training, the first and only mental preparedness training to help commercial astronauts, um, yeah, uh, prepare for space uh, and have been doing that for the last 10 years um, as a trainer and a coach and happy also to have joined the Blue Abyss um, team as well. You might have heard about them in the UK. Um, a very exciting new endeavor. I encourage you to, uh, to have a look at the website. And uh, in the meantime, um, while I'm working on uh, training and coaching people, I've also started to get into the American Standards Technical Committees for commercial spaceflight safety. Um, and some of the stuff that I'm gonna be talking about today is also kind of related to that. Um, uh, lastly, I've uh, written a book um, for both astronauts and non-astronauts called Blast Off Train Like an Astronaut for, for Success on Earth. And uh, also uh, have did a TED talk, um, which is space related. So that's a bit about me. Now, it used to be that the only kind of people who could become astronauts were these top gun types of people, very male survival of the fittest mentality. You either have it or you don't. And they defined the prototype of what an astronaut should be. And we all started to learn that in order to become an astronaut, we had to be like this. And the space agencies that trained and developed astronauts use a very kind of 
similar ideology to select out individuals for the astronaut program. Because they had so many people who wanted to become astronauts, they needed to find a way to narrow down the field. Now, at any time during an astronaut candidate's two or three year training period, if they showed any weakness at all, they might not make it to the end of the program. And this resulted in many astronaut candidates not advertising the shortcomings that they might have or fears that they might have um, because they don't want to be kicked out of the astronaut corps. So this highly competitive system bred a survival of the fittest mentality with those lucky few to make it to the top, leaving many who tried to get there feeling that they were not good enough to go into space. We all grew up thinking that the only way to become an astronaut was to be perfect, both physically and mentally, um, including have no fear. Now, a highly competitive organizational culture emerged with winners and losers, and not necessarily a cooperative, inclusive culture, which helps build up individuals to succeed. And as a result, this survival of the fittest uh, mentality has, typ has typically disadvantaged women and people of color, who those people who don't look the part and ha don't have the attributes, um, or at least on the obvious outside uh, that we're talking about here in this slide. We can observe this fact when we look at the numbers of women um, who, uh, who have made it, um, which is only about 11% of all the astronauts and people of color, even less down to 2% of all the astronauts who are non-white. Um, now it's clear that for the future long-term missions of uh, you know, to the moon and Mars, we're gonna need to have a group, a diverse group of people in order to kind of deal with the real-time problems online. And ideally, we both need the yin and the yang, as well as that cultural diversity if we want our future space, space missions to be successful. But how do we change things? Um, and how do we get out of this, this traditional um, thinking? Well, I think um, thanks to the commercial space and new opportunities it brings, more and more people are able to get um, into space based on other attributes than the traditional astronaut. In the Inspirational Four team comprised of civilian astronauts who recently were in space for about three days, we were able to see regular people who were quite the opposite of the traditional astronaut stereotype. Who, and they admitted that they were fearful of going to space, but, but were empowered by their leader. Now the leader told them that together they were going to succeed and leave no one behind. This was an excellent display of leadership, in my opinion, and inclusiveness, and something to think about and incorporate also into the way we train astronauts because it's becoming, yeah, a different paradigm. A different paradigm. Now I think if we start to do something like this, it will be the start of something new, and we're exposed because we're exposed now to these new role models um, that look and sound completely different than what we're used to than the traditional astronaut. In addition, the space agencies this year are offering opportunities for para-astronauts or disabled astronauts. And now more young girls and people in color and those with disabilities will see that it's possible that they also can get um, into space and give them permission to kind of dream big and pursue their dreams because more and more people will look like them uh, that are going into space. But um, you can see on this slide, there's new attributes. Um, you know, this, uh, these kinds of attributes are, are different than what we're used to, um, where we you know, can admit that we don't, you know, we, we might be scared about going into space or some parts of going into space. Um, you know, we want to care, we care for each other in the team. Um, we're more sociable. Um, and so these are very sort of different attributes that, um, you know, that has been the traditional way of selecting astronauts. And I personally believe that in the future for these long-term missions, personal attributes like having a high uh, emotional intelligence is going to be much more important than someone with a high intellect. So, because let's face it, who would you rather go to space with? Uh, someone who cares only about himself and not very communicative or someone who sees you as an important member of the mission um, and who is team oriented and sociable. I think um, the lone wolf type will need to start to become something of the past. And um, 
Yeah, yeah, because astronauts are going to need to have so many more um, attributes in house, kind of both uh, the yin and the yang, or these attributes, um, you know, where that wasn't necessarily important before. I think not everybody is going to end up fitting the bill uh, on everything, and training is going to need to include to basically fill in the blanks where people um, need to get up to speed in areas where they're going to fall short. Uh, because they won't be able to select perfect individuals on all of these accounts. Um, so NASA and ASA, I think, are starting to recognize this, but we'll also need to think about doing training differently. Uh, so I'm wondering how else training astronauts needs to change in the future. Let's talk about that. I think there's a new paradigm for commercial astronaut training um, that I would like to, uh, to discuss. Um, because I'm, I'd like to speak from my experience as a commercial astronaut trainer and why I believe the space agencies and commercial uh, astronaut operators can actually learn from this new commercial astronaut training paradigm that I see emerging. Commercial astronauts typically are not made of the right stuff and do not have the same kind of attributes like Top Gun uh, types of people. Probably more like the opposite. <laughs> Um, because commercial astronauts are typically unfit individuals who might be a bit on the egocentric side, don't take direction well, and have fears that they might need to overcome in order to even get themselves fit enough to fly. So training is not going to be um, done in the same way that you would train a NASA or ASA astronaut, where you make demands from individuals to do the training. Um, and there's a set training program that they have to go through and fulfill. It's quite the contrary for these kinds of um, opposite of the right stuff type of indiv individuals. Uh, you're going to need to design astronaut training programs for each individual and their mental and physical shortcomings and help them build skills to do the, to basically survive and thrive in space. Um, and not try to force regular people with all of their limitations into demanding um, training programs that don't take these individual shortcomings into account. Using NASA model of training astronauts in the past, I think is an inappropriate way for how to train unskilled, non-military type of people who don't have the right stuff. In this new paradigm, in the areas where people are struggling, we can help them improve their skills. Uh, and, if we, um, and if we can also take into account their individual fears uh, to see if we can help them overcome those fears and or help maybe redesign a task that they need to do. And if that doesn't work and we try you know, to help basically build up the individual and for whatever reason, there's still some limitations, I think that it's time to rely more on the team as a whole and the capability of the team as a whole versus the individual, which is something kind of new um, because we used to select the lone wolf types that can do everything um, and didn't need to rely on anybody else. And communication between members is gonna be even more important because you're gonna to need to be able to rely on one another um, and kind of flag like, hey, I'm not able to do this, can somebody help me? Um, and it might be that we need to start training astronauts, um, yeah, also on skills, um, a more inclusive skills and social skills for long-term space missions, um, because these are things that are going to be important. And it's not good enough just to send people into long-term space missions without those skills, because that will be difficult for the team to be cohesive. So um, yeah, there's a lot of new ways of working and thinking about uh, the individual relative to the team, as well as the, uh, the team's uh, performance is really only as good um, as the weakest link. But if everybody is helping the weakest link, then you know, the team's performance can be quite good. But it's a completely different sort of paradigm than making sure you get you know, perfect mental and physical specimens on your flight. So um, yeah, I think that there can be definitely some things that we can learn from this new approach. But back to short-term uh, space flights, suborbital flights. 
Um, I've been lately involved with the American Standards technical groups who are people creating safety and other standards for the commercial space flight industry. Now, this group works very closely with the FAA. And as I've tried to understand the history of how it's possible that people can go to space um, and without any physical or mental training required from the space flight operators, I've asked several of my colleagues how this came to be. And up until now, the space flight operators have said, don't kill the industry with standards and requirements before it even gets started. Um, and based on the different uh, training programs I've completed and felt the G-forces of a Virgin Galactic flight from start to finish um, in the centrifuge, I personally can't understand how there is no training requirement um, for learning how to stay calm to get through both the high G and the low G demands of the suborbital flight, um, as well as any kind of mental training. At the moment, uh, astronauts are just signing a, a waiver and they can go to space without any training. Um, so I think the minimum uh, requirement for all suborbital astronauts should be what I call the trifecta of astronaut training, consisting of high G centrifuge training, zero G parabolic flights, and the mental preparedness training, um, which underpins everything essentially, because a calm mind focuses, a calm mind uh, with, with specialized mental training for the understanding of different flight phases um, helps you kind of um, get through everything. So um, to me, it, it's kind of inevitable without training individuals that, um, that accidents or incidents will start to happen when people start to fly more regularly. And I believe it's, it's a, you know, that when these things start happening, um, the first incidents or the first accidents, um, requirements will actually start happening. Because um, it, it, kind of it kind of reminds me of the beginning of the commercial um, aircraft uh, industry when people were in airplanes, you know, without seat belts in the beginning, smoking in the back of the planes, uh, you know, and in the laboratories, there were no rules and, um, and until things started to happen, um, you know, people thought about things differently. And now we have, you know, very strict safety regulations for that environment. Um, I, you know, I hope uh, we can learn quicker as, as, an, as the industry than the airline industry. Um, so yeah, I believe, um, you know, it's really interesting at the moment that there really there is no training requirement for performance, but it is really going to be a question of um, waiting until, unfortunately, reactively something happens. Um, so, yeah, I find that very interesting. But I want to talk a little bit more about, um, yeah, what essentially uh, what's happening on these commercial flights. Now, most of you uh, have seen uh, the recent Blue Origin and Virgin Galactic flights. Um, and for those who watched the recent Blue Origin flight with William Shatner, maybe um, you also heard a little bit of the background story of uh, you know, the fact that he said he was always terrified of going into space. Um, here, he looks pretty terrified in this picture. Um, and, you know, getting into the plane, he looked terrified, getting out of the plane, or when he was inside, he was terrified. Um, and then, actually, after the flight, he was explaining his experience to Jeff Bezos, kind of like, you know, a, a straight from the, the heart um, explanation of what, what he felt uh, during the flight. And um, I thought it was fascinating that he started to talk about the training um, that Blue Origin is giving their customers, um, which was, uh, according to William Shatner, nothing like the real thing that he just experienced. And the training and the simulations they did was not helpful at all. Um, you know, essentially what Blue Origin, Virgin Galactic are offering and what they're calling training is a vehicle familiarization um, where they uh, talk about nominal and off nominal scenarios. Um, but this is not the kind of training that masters high G forces, zero G and mental preparedness. And so um, if that's not a testimony to the inadequacy of, of the training offered before the flight, I don't really know what is. 
uh, the training consists um, you know of just really that you know this these simulations um, but not looking at it's not a skill-based training um, and it's not looking at you know essentially how people will stay calm and focused and what they're going to do on their mission while they are in space for those few minutes um, yeah and essentially uh, you know these this the training or the training that's offered, you know, uh, before three days before the flight, um, also doesn't really look at the shortcomings that individuals have um, in order to fly. So William Shatner, when he announced he was terrified and he didn't know if he was up for it, um, you know, there was he was flagging that he potentially um, was not feeling comfortable doing the flight as is and was not given any guidance um, to go and get mental training anywhere else, for example, in this case, or learn to understand what the G-forces were like in a centrifuge. So, um, you know, this is really, you know, to me, a little bit of troubling uh, news at the moment. And so it, it does seem like we will need to wait until real bad incidents happen before the mindset of the FAA uh, will start to become uh, more strict. Um, and, uh, you know, I started to look into like, uh, from, for the American standards technical committee, you know, what's, have there been studies that have looked at performance and how people, uh, were, um, you know, in like in this, in the research. And there have been some studies actually commissioned in the last few years, um, by Virgin Galactic's medical team. Uh, to find out of training for suborbital space um, in the areas that I've just mentioned, the trifecta is really necessary. And there was one study which stood out in my mind. Uh, it was called the effects of training and anxiety on task performance and simulated suborbital space flights. It was from 2017. Um, and yeah, essentially the study echoes the results, what many studies also uh, have said which is that you know, individuals are not able to follow basic emergency procedures, um, basic procedures, um, and their individuals experience higher levels of fear and anxiety on their flight. Um, some existing medical conditions can be exacerbated if experiencing these flights like a vestibular or cardiovascular um, and less likely uh, without any kind of training to have capacity over for accomplishing their own mission, which um, to me, this is, yeah, it's it's incredible that you would go and pay a lot of money to go into space, um, you know, not train yourself and have a high probability of failing of whatever your mission is. Um, so what this study and other studies that are similar similar to this study have said is that training programs appear best when high fidelity fidelity and sequential exposure may improve tolerance for the physical and the psychological flight stressors. So, you know, again, um, yeah, the, these studies are basically all saying the same thing, that people's performance will improve when they are um, doing several runs of um, zero-G training, centrifuge training, and when they're, you know, when they have some mental preparation. Just to add a level, another level of complexity to the picture on how to train people for their suborbital flight and their suborbital missions. We have two main kinds of participants on these suborbital flights. We have the space flight participant and the space scientist, um, and probably you know, many more or combinations of these um, individuals. Um, but essentially the space flight participants really in their going to space to enhance their own sensory experience. Perhaps they want to experience the overview effect by looking outside. So their focus is outside of the plane. Um, it's going to be a once in a lifetime experience. There's a high potential for freezing or panicking, uh, especially if they do not get any kinds of training. And for them, it's all about maximizing their own space to play in the, in the, in the space um, capsule. Now, to contrast, the space scientist um, you know, is there to do a job. They're on duty. They have to run their experiment. 
the focus is very much inside their spacecraft, um, you know, in their own little world, in their own bubble. Uh, they might have multiple opportunities to go into space, but they definitely don't want disturbance um, to their experiment, which could be physical, audio, or visual, which is going to hinder the completion of their experiment. And you know, these these um, these two objectives are quite different. If you think about um, wanting to train individually individuals for their mission, um, it would be a completely different type of training. If I were training a space scientist. Um, to you know, execute their experiment and to kind of stay without any focus, without any kind of distractions in their own small space versus if I were to be training somebody who's going to be making somersaults um, and try to maximize their space to play, um, who is you know, uh, screaming through the, through the spacecraft you know, and having, wanting a great time. And you know, there's no guarantee that these two types of participants are not going to be flying on the same uh, you know, in the same spacecraft together. So um, given those limitations, first of all, understanding how to train yourself is extremely important, but also understanding what's going on around you with the other people and who are they and what their objectives are. Um, all of this needs to come into play when training people for space. And also, uh, you know, the three days ahead of time when you get there, it's extremely important to, you um, yeah, to figure all of this, uh, this sort of stuff out and who you're flying with and what are you gonna do so that everybody can um, maximize their objectives as much as possible. Um, if we wanna be inclusive also, the training will need to accommodate all of these different training needs from different types of individuals um, and not have this one size fits all approach. Now, just to go into a little bit more detail about how training needs to accommodate individuals with individual objectives, I'd like to focus on a spaceflight participant and see exactly what kind of tasks are needed, um, for example, on a Virgin Galactic flight. Now, the left-hand column, if we break down the mission into its subparts um, and the subtasks that uh, the sub, uh, suborbital spaceflight participant will be doing, from start to finish, um, we're gonna see for the entire 90 minutes of the journey and maybe a little bit um, in terms of preparation before the journey, these are the tasks on the left on the left hand side column. Um, I've not gone into more detail here during the four minutes of zero G, but ideally I would when I'm dealing with an individual's individual mission, because this is the place where things are gonna vary the most. So just, I gave some examples here. Um, step seven, under the weightlessness phase, you know, if you are there to um, do somersaults and acrobatic moves uh, while you're in zero G, um, you know, as I said, you're gonna have, a, you're gonna train for that in a different way than if you were going to try to kind of tune everything out and look outside the window and hope that the overview effect um, happens to you completely different types of training that you'll need in order to um, achieve either of those uh, missions. Um, and that's where things are gonna be varying the most. Now, if we're talking about inclusiveness and taking individuals' needs into account and people's shortcoming, this is where the tailor making of the astronaut training occurs. Now, on the right side of the task, um, these are the optimal responses for the tasks on the left side. And what I mean by optimal is that if these tasks are executed correctly, the individual will accomplish um, his or her mission in space. Now, if one of, or more of those tasks in the right-hand side do not happen uh, during the given time that they need to happen or not happen well, um, it's going to jeopardize their individual mission. So for example, if after the high G launch at three and a half uh, Gs, step five, um, the person will need to do the anti-gravity straining maneuver, essentially a breathing exercise that keeps the blood in uh, their head because it's, the launch is going to draw it down, their blood down to their feet. Um, if they don't do that well, um, they, uh, you know, they might, or even worse, if they pass out, they will not be able to do the next step on time 
which is to mentally prepare themselves for the weightlessness phase to sort of collect oneself before the big moment is going to be happening. Um, and that, you know, would be a shame because once you're, you know, you haven't, uh, you know, been able to execute staying calm and focused before your mission is actually going to start, which is the weightlessness phase, um, you know, you could be, um, if you're still passed out, you might kind of come to two minutes into the four minutes of your weightlessness phase. Um, so you'll always be a little bit behind or you, you won't be mentally in the right state of mind to actually execute whatever you want to execute for your mission. And of course, that's going to be a shame in terms of, you know, maximizing the enjoyment time and probably a complete waste of money. So in summary, uh, commercial astronauts of the future are going to need to be trained in a completely different way than we expect um, for agency astronauts. With increasing demands of astronauts and complex missions uh, for both professional and commercial astronauts, nobody's going to be able to fit the bill, I think, in the future um, with all requirements. So training will have to include filling in the missing skills and helping individuals get up to speed in the areas where they fall short instead of trying to select perfect individuals on all accounts and have a standard training program applied to everyone. I think this approach is gonna help both astronauts, uh, commercial astronauts, in addition to the agency or the professional astronauts. And therefore adapting a more inclusive approach as I mentioned in this talk should help on all accounts. I'd really love to hear any comments you have about this talk. So please feel free to contact me um, and looking forward to you know, continuing the conversation. Okay, thanks very much.